right? Too much order, too much chaos, both catastrophes. You want to stand in the middle somehow and mediate between the two. And that's where you have your real strength. Because then it isn't that you've discovered a safe place. Because even the bloody right-wingers are after a safe place, right? They just want it to be the state. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's no safe places. And the next issue is, do you really want a safe place? Is that what you want? You want to be so weak that you want to be protected from threat. What the hell kind of life is that? You're a paralyzed rabbit in a hole. That's no life for a human being. You should be confronting danger and the unknown and malevolence. Because, and the reason for that, too, is this is the weird paradox. This is, and I believe this is the paradox, first of all, that was discovered in part by Buddha, but also laid forth very clearly in Christianity, which is that the, the solution to the problem of tragedy and malevolence is the willingness to face them. Now, who the hell would ever guess that? It's completely paradoxical. It's a completely paradoxical suggestion. Is that, well, why does it work? Well, because the more you confront the two of them, the more you grow. And maybe you can grow so that you're actually larger than the chaos and malevolence itself. And you think, well, what's the evidence for that? And that's easy. That's what people do. That is how we learn. Like, every time you expose your child to something new, a playground, what are they exposed to? Chaos and malevolence. Now, there's more to it than that, obviously, because kids play and they, you know, they promote each other and they form friendships and all of that. But in the playground itself, there is the complexity of the social structure and the malevolence of the bully. It's right there. And the, you throw your kid in there and you say, adapt. And they do. Okay, so they can do it at a, a small scale. It's not trivial. The, the playground's a complicated place. The kid can adapt. Well, how much can you scale that up? Can you scale that up to, from the chaos and order and malevolence of the playground to chaos and order and malevolence itself? Well, that's the question. Well, I don't think there's any reason to answer that in the negative. So, because we don't know the full extent of a human being. And it is the problem that's worked out. So, in the Buddha story, for example, what happens after... So, Buddha's world collapses in the same way that Adam and Eve's world collapses. It's a consequence of repetitive exposure to mortality and death. What happens to Buddha is he realizes that the little protected city that his father made for him, the walled garden, it's exactly the same motif that's in this Adam and Eve story, is, is it's, it's, what? It's, it's fatally flawed. That kind of protection cannot exist, and he, he discovers that in pieces, right? Which is exactly what happens to children, is that they go out, they discover a limit, they run back. And the parents can help them with the limit. They run out, they discover a limit, they run back. But some, at some point, they run out, they discover a limit, they run back, and the parents have nothing to say to them. Because they've hit the same limit that the parents hit. Which is like, well, what are you going to do with your life? How are you going to, how are you going to operate in this archetypal universe? Well, your parents can only say, well, they can say, you identify with the proper archetypal figures. And they do that, they at least act that out for you. But at some point, it's a problem that they cannot solve for you without making you weaker. That's the thing, you know. So it's an interesting thing that I've learned in therapy. Because one of the things you have to learn as a therapist is how do you not take your client's problems home with you? It's a very common existential problem that beginning therapists face because they're afraid. It's like, well, you're dealing with people all the time who have serious problems. Sometimes it's mental illness, although less frequently than you'd think. And sometimes it's just that they're having a good catastrophe, right? Their, their parents have cancer or something like that, or their father has Alzheimer's and they're unemployed, or they have a drug problem, or they have an, an, a schizophrenic son, or like, these aren't mental illness problems, right? Those are just catastrophes. And so people are discussing those with you all the time. How do you avoid being crushed by that or avoid taking it home? And the answer to that is, you don't steal the problem. That, that's the answer. It's like, you have some problems. If you come and talk to me, I'll help you figure out how to solve them. I will not tell you how to solve them. I won't steal your problems. Because what we're trying to do in therapy is, number one, solve your problem. Number two, turn you into a great solver of problems. And the second one is way more important than the first one. And so you never solve someone's problem by removing from them the opportunity to solve their problem. That's theft. That's the Oedipal situation. That's the Oedipal situation. That's the overprotective mother. Now, father can play that role too. We're talking about archetypal representations. 
It's like, I'll protect you at the cost of your ability to protect yourself. No. Wrong. That's, the, that's a sin. That's a good way of thinking about it. That is not what you do with people. Not with your children, not with your partner, not with yourself. You don't do that. That destroys people's adaptive competence. And it, and it disarms them in the face of chaos and malevolence. And that's a terrible... Th You're going to send someone out unarmed in a world like that? It's a terrible thing to do. So, and if people aren't strong enough to manage it, then they get resentful. And then, you know, you get the downhill spiral that goes along with that. Okay, so the meta story is partly... You're in a map, you're, you have a map, but it's insufficient and things will come up to disrupt it. And sometimes the disruption is catastrophic. Everything falls apart. That's what happens to the Buddha, and that's what happens to Adam and Eve. And the rest of the biblical stories are actually an attempt to put that back together. Now, that, that, that's been assembled, as I said, it's been assembled over centuries, right? Okay, we've got the problem. The problem is the apocalypse, the ever-present reality of the apocalyptic fall. That's the problem. And so you could say, well, what is that? It's the insufficiency of all potential conceptual schemes. Right. Your conceptual schemes are insufficient to deal with the complexity of the world. It's a permanent problem. So what do you do? You stop relying on your conceptual schemes. That's part of the answer. You start relying on your, instead, on your ability to actively generate conceptual schemes in the face of chaos and malevolence. And so that makes you someone that identifies with your creative capacity, your creative, courageous capacity for articulation and action in the face of the unknown, rather than some formulaic approach to the territory. And that, and that the idea is that that elevates your character to the point where you can withstand tragedy and malevolence without becoming corrupt. And that provides a permanent solution to the problem. Well, then you might say, cynically, what's your evidence that that's a permanent solution? And the answer to that is, well, the evidence isn't all in yet. First of all, because people only live that way partially. And so we haven't put the hypothesis to the full test. And second, we don't know what our limitations are. We have no idea what our limitations are. And they're, they're both greater and lesser than we imagined. Because you, you, know, you have to ask yourself, like, if people stopped adding voluntarily to the misery of the world, and devoted themselves to setting things straight, setting themselves straight, and setting the things around them straight, what would happen? And the answer to that is, well, there'd be a hell of a lot less unnecessary misery in the world. So that might not be a bad place to start. But apart from that, there's very little that we can say. Could we overcome the catastrophe of mortality? Why not? You think that's beyond our capacity? Could we make the world a place where no one was suffering any more than necessary and still allow the world to exist? Well, possibly, because we don't know the limitations of our capacity. We're only running at 40%, if that, I would say. If we don't make full use of all the people that are in the world. We don't have our situation set up so that the gifts that they could offer to everyone are fully realized. We haven't set the systems up for that yet, so we waste people like mad. And then we waste ourselves like mad. And so I would say, this is something also that's... One of the things that's really interesting about the Old Testament Jews, this is, I think, one of the reasons that their book has become so central, is because what happens in the Old Testament after the fall is that Israel produces a series of states, right? Rise of state and then a fall, and then a rise of another state and then a fall. So it's the same thing, except it's happening at a political level. The political state rises, it gets corrupt, it falls. It rises out of the ashes again, gets corrupt, and falls. I think that happens six times in the Old Testament. And one of the things is, that's very interesting is the reaction of the Jews. They always say, it was our fault. Instead of taking the Cain and Abel route, so and I'm going to tell you the Cain and Abel story right away. Instead of taking the Cain and Abel route, they always say, if the state collapsed, it was because we did something wrong. That's very different than saying, you know, it's arbitrary fate, it's the nature of arbitrary fate, or the structure of reality, that we're doomed to collapse into chaos, and that's an indication of the corruption of being. Well, you can take that route if you want, it's the corruption of being. Well, good luck with that. So what are you going to do about that? That's easy. Start, you'll start to work for the destruction of being. That's what you will do. The alternative is to say, this terrible thing happened, and somehow it's my fault. 
well, at least that lead opens you up to the pathway to doing something about it, and maybe it's actually the case. Maybe terrible things happen because you're just not who you should be. At least it's a night, you know that's true to some degree, right? You know it. Because things happen to you all the time, and you think, well, you know, if I just would have played that game straight, and if I would have put this thing in order, that wouldn't have happened. It's like, okay, fine. What's the ultimate extent of that? Dostoevsky said at one point, that every human being was not only responsible for everything that happened to him or her, but also simultaneously responsible for everything that happened to everyone else. Now it's a very, it's a, I would say it's almost a hallucinogenic idea, right? It's a, it's a transcendent idea and it can go very wrong. Sometimes depressed people, for example, get hyper-responsible for what's happened and just crushes them. And so it's a, it's a, it's a mode of thinking that can produce its attendant pathologies. But there's something about it that's there's something about it that's metaphysically true. So 